Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he doesn't just play EDH or even just play pre-DH, he plays Glee DH, where you have to sing the whole time. It's Matt Morgan. So what did one tectonic plate say to the other tectonic plate? Oh no, something shifty, I'll bet. No, it was it really just said, well, it's not my fault, it's yours. <laughs> that, that's good, too. Although I'm proud of myself for my response there, Matt. Give me a little credit one of these days. I, I mean, I'm sorry. The, my delivery on that one was a little rocky, so we can probably just move on. <laughs> that's that okay. took some stones, Matt. That took some stones. I know. It, it, it just it rubs me the wrong way there. Wow, good. <laughs> okay. Up next, he doesn't just play EDH or PreDH or GleeDH. He plays the knights who say NEDH. It's Dana Roach. Uh, why are there fish at the bottom of the sea? Oh, goodness, why? They dropped out of school. <laughs> that, that's deep. D dang it. Wow. Well done. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even trying to make commentary there. That was just a very deep cut. <laughs> wow. Matt just found a two word dad joke and I'm kind of in love with that. How do you do this? <laughs> you're, you're I mean, I did, I did not drop out of school. That's actually that's a lie. I dropped out of college, too. So uh, <laughs> okay. I relate to the fishes. I, I better better to relate to the fishes than to sleep with them. Hey, eh? hey, eh? is my dad joke successful? Never mind. We're gonna get to our topic. Matt, save me from my embarrassment here at the beginning of the show. What are we talking about in in the show this week? Well, this week we are gonna talk about some commanders that go against conventional deck building principles, rules, whatever you want to call them. Basically, commanders that don't do what we tell people they should be doing when they're building their commander decks. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of deck building heuristics out there, some different rules that we tend to encourage folks to follow in the format to help them with smoother deck building. But these commanders should not follow those heuristics, and it'll be very interesting to see what they are. But before we get started, we got some shout outs to do. We'd like to thank Chase, also known as Manic Curves, for the help in editing the show. You can find them on Twitter at Manic Curves. We also want to shout out Coalesce Apparel and Design, who make awesome magic-inspired merch. And if you use code EDHREC, you'll get 10% off your purchase. They have an Omnath Rock and Royal shirt that you should check out if you love Landfall. And we, of course, recommend the EDHREC collection as well. These shirts are also, like, crazy comfy, by the way. Once again, that's code EDHREC at checkout for 10% off your order. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by liking and subscribing this video on YouTube, subscribing on your local podcast app, or by going to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, where we have patron tiers of all sorts of levels, whether you want to join the Discord community or any other other benefits, there's all that and more. Just a nice way to get yourself a nice little reward for supporting the show, including the weekly shout out, which this week we are going to give to Nicholas Walsh. And I have nothing as far as puns about Nicholas Walsh's <laughs> name, Nick. <laughs> Nicholas, Nikki, I, I how, I'm sorry. I've let you down, and that that's on that's on me. You had a long weekend, so it's, it was it's, a long weekend. Matt, it's it's probably okay. You know, we don't have to have puns it's and not, dad jokes not. for every shout out. <laughs> so, Joey, there are some there, there are expectations that our patrons have, and part of that appeal of of getting the shout out is me just butchering their name in some form or fashion. <laughs> And, and this week, I'm just, I mean, I guess this whole conversation about me just being terrible at this probably is the reward in itself. <laughs> yes, I, I suppose. I suppose so. It's it's in the fourth year of college, Matt, that they teach you how to um, actually pronounce names. So it's understandable wow. why you, you may have missed it. I, I was there for a semester in the fourth year. <laughs> oh, okay. all right. All right. So you, you got half the classes. Half, that, yeah. that was a deep cut, Dana. I'm very impressed. Um, okay, we're 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 in a callbacks mood. important part of humor. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, we I think we probably need to just get right to our topic <laughs> right, here, yes. probably sooner than later. Thank you again, Nicholas Walsh, for your support. We appreciate it so much. All right, yeah, Matt. As you said, we're talking about some commanders that go against some of those typical conventional deck building principles, and this is going to be kind of a bit of a zoom out approach like 
In the past, we've had some episodes about commanders that, for example, hate EDH staples, like commanders that don't play the typical staples in the format, like Soul Ring, or commanders that choose not to play the great big stuff like that. This isn't going to be about any individual cards. It's going to be more about like talking about commanders that go against the grain on certain types of categories, for instance, that type of thing. And I think that'll be pretty interesting to dive into. And this, this one can be very tricky until you actually start playing the commander and get a few games under your belt and realize that the, the some of these basics you've been taught don't necessarily apply to this particular deck. Um, so we're maybe save you a little bit of time here if you're going to build any of the commanders or any any of these deck styles that we're going to discuss. Just going in and knowing that like maybe the rules that usually apply don't necessarily apply here. And it, well, it's always funny too because anytime that we make a definitive statement about oh most players aren't playing enough lands, there's always somebody you know who you are because you're probably that person. <laughs> That's like, well, my right. Marwin the Nurturer deck, for example, doesn't play 36 lands. Well, we're going to talk about all those types of commanders and all those exceptions to the rules this week. Uh, yeah, and, and that's true. Like, yeah, there are, it's difficult to ever make a broad sweeping statement because there are always going to be those exceptions. Um, and, and Maru and the Nurturer is, I think, a perfect place to start because Dana, tying back into what you just said, you've had some experience with Maru and the Nurturer, uh, haven't you? Um, when you first built that deck and loaded it with a bunch of lay. Right. Yeah, and especially, so in, in, in this case, it was a, it's a budget deck I built, so I have like a, a cheap, relatively easy deck to play that I can bring to my my local game shop and because it was a deck i was building for for newer players or something i actually put more lands than i would traditionally put in a deck in it mm. so, so i doubled up the problem it's a it's a deck that generally needs less lands because of both how marwin works and how elves work a lot of them tend to be mana dorks and marwin taps for a crazy amount of mana sometimes true so so not only did i you know it doesn't not need a ton of lands i put more than usual in there because i i thought well i want to make sure this whoever this hypothetical newer player is doesn't get flooded out and it became readily apparent very very quickly a few games in that like there's just too many lands. It just does not need to be running 37 lands. Well, and so the big reason, for those of you who don't know, that Marwin the Nurture doesn't need a bunch of lands is because Marwin makes a ton of mana on her own. So Marwin the Nurture is two and a green for a legendary elf druid. And whenever another elf enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Marwin the Nurturer, and then you can tap Marwin to add green equal to Marwin's power. So the bigger Marwin gets, the more elves you're playing, the more mana she's tapping for. So it's yeah. it's very easily because elves are very well known for going wide and just putting a bunch of bodies on the battlefield. That's why Marwin just gets so out of control so quickly. It's so easy to dump your hand in that deck. And, and yeah, I think uh, you guys have mentioned there a couple of times that like 36 or 37 lands tends to be a traditional starting point for us when we are building our decks. And this commander absolutely defies that convention because on average, Marwin decks are only playing about 30 lands according to the EDH rec database. So it's good to see that players are not <laughs> falling into the same mistake that you were, Dana, but your intentions were absolutely in the right place when you were trying to put this thing together. Like, and it only took a couple of games, it sounds like, for you to realize, oh, I'm way flooded on this. But in general, like, if you run 30 lands in any other deck, you're going to have many problems. So, like, <laughs> I'm glad that you found this out in an organic way and that your, your heart was always in the right place when you were trying to put it together. But this is an exception that I think proves a certain rule, so to speak. Yeah, although it's definitely not the only exception. Um, mm. Urza uh, High Artificer would be one as well. Um, you know, t two and a blue for uh, Human Artificer. When Urza ETBs, you create a zero, zero colorless construct artifact creature. Um, and you, you can tap an unfact untapped artifact you control, excuse me, and add a blue mana. Um, it's a deck where everything is a mana rock, basically, and there's a ton of zero and one drop mana rocks functionally that, that you can run in that deck, um, or, or cards that become mana rocks, I should say, when Urza's is out. So again, that's a, that's a deck where it, it, coming at it from a different direction, but it also produces an insane amount of mana that makes it so you just don't necessarily need to run nearly as much lands as you normally would. Only 30 lands in that average deck too. Wow, goodness. But then when you look at the typical deck for Urza though, once you get Urza in play, you really don't need any more mana sources because like Dana, you mentioned, Urza turns everything into its own mana source. So you have everything right. like Icker Wellspring and the card that you're playing in quite a few decks or even all your artifact creatures. So you have Spellskite and all these things are going to protect your battlefield. 
Well, those are tapping for mana too. So Ethereum Sculpture kind of becomes almost a soul ring because it's already reducing the cost of your artifacts by one, but also then it starts tapping for a blue. Mm -hmm. So it, there's all these just wild, silly synergies in Urza decks that just kind of build upon each other and build upon each other. You know what I really need was for this commander to play Tormod's Crypt, a zero mana artifact that exiles all cards from target player's graveyard. Like 55% of Urza players are running this because it's also like it's tapping for mana. That's really what I needed with my life right now is for a very efficient piece of graveyard hate to also give this deck a whole bunch of mana whenever you need it. Like, ugh. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm happy for your Urza, but I'm also really not happy for you, Urza. I mean, I don't think Urza needs anybody to be happy for them, <laughs> considering the popularity and reputation that Urza's built for themselves. <laughs> yeah, v very, very much. And I think, frankly, this is just sort of a pattern that we're seeing. When the commander in your command zone is able to help you produce a lot of extra mana resources, that has a substantial effect on the number of lands that that deck runs on average. Another example here that we could see that has only 30 lands on average for the average deck is Kinnon Bonder Prodigy, a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two human druid that says whenever you tap a non-land permanent for mana, you add 1 mana of any type that that permanent produced, and there is an outlet and activated ability that costs 7 mana on this commander that also lets you dig to find more stuff and also again only 30 lands in this average deck because the deck is full of the Findhorn elves the elvish mystics the land of war elves like a whole bunch of those different mana dorks so you want a whole bunch of the mana dorks to take the spotlight and you don't need to be flooded out on lands because you're digging for something else entirely yeah the, the one tricky thing uh, to to i guess maybe caution about with these is now you do have to have mana to get the commander in play in the first place. Mm. So so that's the one the, where one thing you have to maybe work on yourself to find what balance is comfortable for you. You can absolutely run less lands because so many things in your deck make mana, but you still need to have enough lands to be able to get Marwyn or Urza or Kinnon or, or whomever out in the first place. Um, and maybe you offset that by like understanding that this deck requires you to mull a little bit more aggressively. Mm. Um, and so maybe you have to adapt some of your, you know, typical play patterns, um, for this one specific deck to adjust for that. But that's, that's definitely something I think you should be aware of for, for particularly talking about land count, but for a lot of these decks, like because of the way that the balance is thrown off, um, it might also throw off traditional play patterns. No, that's a really good point. I, I like. I don't want to make a generalized, a blanket statement that if the commander produces mana for you, then you're set. You don't. You can get away with running fewer lands for sure. Because yeah. there are some commanders that are playing a more you know reasonable number of lands out there. Magus Lucia Kane, for example, is one of those Warhammer decks, and this commander also has an ability that adds mana to your mana pool. But the average deck is playing like 35 or 36 lands, which makes a whole lot of sense because this is a very big mana deck. And Dana, to your point, it's got three colors and getting those three colors could be a little bit tricky so you do want to make sure that you have enough variability of mana resources you have enough access to lands to get the commander out in the first place and since you're trying to do a whole lot of big mana stuff later on into the game you're not at risk of flooding here in the same way that you would be for those elfish type of decks i well and joe you hinted at something i think is very important to keep in mind with that specific deck is th having three colors. So having different color pips you have to get at any given time mm -hmm. requires more resources on the battlefield. Whereas single color decks, um, once you get everything moving, uh, Marwin makes all the mana and all the colors of mana that you need. So you don't really need that from your lands. Whereas in three color decks, you do need a little bit more fixing. And the easiest and most reliable way to do that is from your mana base. So doing that through lands, that's is, to me, that's going to be the biggest factor in why three color decks, even though the commander might have some mana ability, you're still going to need quite a few lands because you need to have that balance of your colors taken care of, especially when the commander itself isn't making colored mana. Yeah, very much. Like, I've got that, th this is kind of an off <laughs> example here, but uh, you guys know that I have that Commander Commander deck where I'm playing a four color deck, it's got partners in the command zone, and every card in the deck has to say the word Commander on it. It's a very silly theme deck that I've got going on there. And folks tend to be surprised when they see that I'm running either 39 or 40 lands in that deck. They're like, what's going on there? And the reason for that is because, Matt, as you mentioned, I need that variability. I need the access to extra lands because sometimes just drawing enough lands isn't really enough i need to have a choice of which color of lands that i can do because my lands are very strict in that deck too the word commander has to be on my non-basic lands if i'm going to play them in that deck so i've run like 39 or 40 lands in that deck to make sure that if i've drawn multiple lands i have 
potentially more options to choose from and that just tends to smooth things out a little bit more than if i were to play like 36 lands like yeah i might hit my land drops but i might not have choice of colors in that situation so having a little bit of extra lands as you said definitely helps you with your color sorting well you also have weird like corner case commanders like gearson starn Kellermore, for example hmm. where the commander is so fast at what it does that you don't necessarily need to to have this amount of the, the amount of lands you normally would because you're not planning on having to need a land drop on on, on turn seven or eight or something like the deck just moves at light speed. Uh, Gearson Starn is a is a three mana commander three for three two with Ward two, which seems really unnecessary given how good this commander is. It's so true. <laughs> it has an ability whenever another source you control deals exactly one damage to a permanent or player. Gearson Starn deals two damage to that permanent or player. So it, it's basically a way to turn something that deals one into into three. And yeah, it, it's just a commander that's off to the races immediately blasting people in the face. So the deck just gets by with being a little bit leaner because it's trying to win as fast as possible. Yeah, I think the average mana curve data that we see on EDA Trek for this commander is especially illuminating here because it looks very different from a lot of the other commanders that we see. On average, this deck only plays one five drop and three six drops. And nothing past that. <laughs> like, the mana curve on this commander is so, so low. It, it's it's so blisteringly fast. Like, it's it's playing basically everything is consolidated at one, two, and three mana. <laughs> that, yeah, you're just like, as you said, land drops on turn seven? What This commander's like, what is a turn seven? I don't know. I don't know her. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and when the deck is so fast, it, you want, even if the game does happen to get to that stage and something goes up, like falls apart... The deck has a ton of redundancy, too. Uh, so you have Gel Electrode, you have Firebrand Archer, you have Thermo Alchemist, you have all these pingers that are going to just start triggering Gerson Starn's abilities. And it's not even that it's a fast deck. It's reliably fast. So there's no reason to have backup plans when uh. your backup plan is just to play another card that's going to just activate Gerson and, and win you the game. On the other hand here, you have commanders that require more lands than are normal. You have, you know, Marwin, where if you're running too many lands, you're going to produce so much mana that you don't need to have them constantly popping up. Well, there are some commanders that require lands for so many different things beyond just dropping one a turn that if you don't have an, you know, a, a higher than an average amount of lands in the deck, they're also just going to not function correctly. Borbrigmos and Rage is the first one that pops into my mind. Mm. Uh, it's an eight mana, mana commander with Trample, um, but what's most importantly here is you can just discard a land card whenever you want to. It's right there on the on the commander's rule text and deal three damage to a creature or a player. So basically every land is a lightning bolt that you can cast for free as long as your commander's out. You just always want to have lands in hand with that deck and the best way to guarantee that is to just run a weird amount of lands. This commander runs an average of 45 lands in the typical Borgorigmos Enraged deck. And, I mean, when you're using that ability to deal damage with the commander directly by discarding a land, and you slap a Keen Sense or a Snake Umbra onto it so that every time it deals any type of damage you draw a card... It feels really good to know that you're reliably going to chain one land, deal damage, into another land to deal damage, and you can just bzzzt your opponents down just like that. Like, yeah, the, the lands themselves are the weapons there. You do not want to run out. This is probably the most extreme example, but an extremely good example. Well, and, and it's super funny because, you like you said, you can just chain through everything super quickly, but also because Bulbarigmos is eight mana himself. You need a lot of lands because you need to have a lot of lands on the battlefield first before you can even get Angry Bobo onto the battlefield. <laughs> so it's it's doubly important that I, I even would argue the typical deck is running 45 lands. That's probably still a little bit low, if we're going to be honest, because yeah. you need to get to eight mana first and then you need to have a bunch of lands in your hand to make the ability actually usable. So there's a lot going on in, in the Borborygmos Enraged deck that... Yeah, you, you really are very, very dependent on lands. So why not just go overboard with them a little bit? Yeah, well, and I think just sort of the entire category of landfall in general is one of those where I'm pretty sure a thing that we've said here is that instead of like running an average of 36 or 37 lands, like we tend to start with most decks, like Matt, I know that you tend to preach that like 40 is your typical starting point for any deck that cares about landfall as the mechanic or the driving theme of the deck. And I'm with you on the 40 as well. 40 tends to be my minimum for landfall. Yeah, well, it, this it, 
it's not really landfall, but it kind of is because it's the, the lands are just falling from your hand into the graveyard because you want to be pitching them to, to Borborygmos. But yes, even in the, the basic, basic landfall themed decks, you need a bunch of lands because all you're doing is pulling those lands from your deck and eventually you just want to make sure you don't run out. Right. Like, we've all had that experience, right? We've all cracked an Evolving Wilds in a Landfall deck and realized, oh, I'm out of basics. Right. Like, I'm right. sure we've all experienced that before, yeah? Well, that happens when you run six basics. Like, it's, well, it's a very okay. frequent occurrence. <laughs> well, only for you, Dana. Only because you hate basic lands. But but that's why certain new cards like Awaken the Woods are so interesting for Landfall decks, right? Because those create land tokens, and that prevents us from, like, having those situations where we draw a, a, some type of of land ramp spell in the deck and there aren't any targets to hit with it anymore and uh, yeah i just feel like playing more basics is good for you Dana. but also in the cases of these landfall decks like you can absolutely feel free to play more because those lands are the engine of your deck and you need a high high density of them now kind of in parallel to this i would say though those decks probably also need more draw than decks traditionally do because you can't pitch those lands to Borbo or you can't put them into play with like a Zuso off but seeking until they're in your hand in the first place. Um, and not that like card draw is ever a problem. I've never walked away from a game thinking, man, I, I would have won if I wouldn't have drawn so many cards. <laughs> um, like it's never bad to have a bunch of card draw in, in your deck, but like those those decks also kind of simultaneously need to run more draw than average too. So you can just make sure you constantly have a full hand of, of those lands to, to do the thing that is written right there on the card that it wants you to do. Well, and yeah, so there's there's always certain things that the cards are telling you you want to do. The commander's telling you what you want to do. Joe, I'm going to tell you what I want to do, and that's go to challenge the stats. Wow. And this is a really good time to do that because let's do it. Why not? Wow, Matt. Okay. Well, I guess that you can say that your your challenge the stats segue really landed this week. Yeah. You, no, no, we can't do that. That's good. We can't. It's good. I get praise on a dad joke from Matt. <laughs> I, I went orcish lumberjack on the challenge this week and just like knocked it all down. <laughs> Goodness. Okay. Yes. Let's, I guess we can challenge some of those statistics. We'll take a quick break and come back with that. All right, well, I'll start us off this week with a challenge for a card that is seeing too much play in Otrimi the Ever Playful decks. That is the Sultai Mutant Commander. It mutates for four onto one of your creatures, has trample, and it also says whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you return target creature card with mutate from your graveyard to your hand. And there's a card on Otrimi's page that I'm just really skeptical about. It's the card Mysterious Egg, a one mana colorless creature type egg that says whenever this creature mutates, put a plus one plus one counter on it. And it's a zero two at base. So it, I know it seems cute. 27% <laughs> of Atrimi players are using this one. I can just imagine a lot more interesting stuff that I would like to mutate onto instead of the Mysterious Egg, though. Like, literally right next to this card on Otrimi's page is the card Glade Cover Scout, which is a 1-1 with Hexproof. And, like, base Hexproof sounds really cool to me. Or putting stuff onto a Scoot Swarm seems really cool to me as well to copy things a whole bunch more. Heck, even putting your mutations onto a Spawn Writhe to copy a bunch of them, that also sounds really cool. If I want to power up my big mutation creature, I do not think that this is an efficient way to do it. This card didn't even show up in the Otrimi precon, so folks are going out of their way to acquire it for this deck. And I thought at first that maybe this was like a pick for budget Otrimi decks, but I did a little bit of tinkering with the advanced filters on EDHREC to only see deck data for Otrimi decks that do include Mysterious Egg. And those decks are not just budget decks, they're still using expensive cards like the Boseju land or cards like Vesuvian Duplomancy. So, like, it isn't just a budget pick here. I think that this one is cute, but it is not the most efficient thing that you could be doing with this deck. So I'd say that Mysterious Egg is overplayed at 27%, and you should make room for more exciting cards to mutate onto. So that's my pick. What do you guys got? Well, I'll go next now. So my challenge actually comes from getting to play against one of your friends, actually, Dana. We were at Magic Con Minneapolis this past weekend. I got to play against your friend Joe, or you can find them on Twitter, at Ginger Joe. But they had a Rhea Evor Bane of Bladehold deck, which is the Orzov token-y kind of commander that came out in All Will Be One. That there was a synergy there that I was kind of blown away with, and I, I absolutely love it. And the stats back up that people aren't really playing this. So Rhea Evor has Battle Cry and is a 3-4 that says at the beginning of combat on your turn, the next time target creature would deal combat damage, 
to one more players this combat. Prevent that damage. If damage is prevented this way, create that many 1-1 one, one colorless Phyrexian Might creature tokens with Toxic 1, and this creature can't block. So the card that just absolutely I could not get over how good it was in that deck is one that I feel kind of bad saying that I like it because it's, it is an uncard. Everyone knows I'm not a big fan of them, but Starlight Spectacular was actually just spectacular in this deck. <laughs> uh, so Starlight Spectacular is kind of the fixed and less impossible to track. Cathar's Crusade, which gets just out of hand every time a creature comes in. So when Rhea E4 is putting a bunch of creatures on the battlefield, especially at different times, say you have multiple turns doing this, it gets really hard to track. But Starlight Spectacular takes care of all that because at the beginning of combat on your turn, you choose creatures you control one at a time until each creature you control has been chosen. Each of those creatures gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each creature chosen before it. So if you have a small army out there and you choose Rhea Evor as the last creature out there, it's going to get a huge buff from all the other creatures on the battlefield, which you then can just fog your your biggest creature there, Rhea Evor, and have a whole bunch more mites come down for the next turn that are just going to feed into Starlight Spectacular all over again. It's a spectacular way just to get the battlefield clogged up super far. So granted, your mites can't block, so this deck doesn't play defense very well at all. Mm -hmm. But holy cow, only 23 decks playing Rhea Evor are actually using Starlight Spectacular. It's such a powerful, powerful synergy. You can combine it with Nettlesis to make even bigger Rhea Evors. Oh, wow. It's just, oh, oh, it's out of hand. It's absolutely silly. Well, Ginger Joe, thanks for uh, getting Matt and, and knocking him out of the game. I appreciate that. <laughs> I have to do that, but like, well, if I can farm that out to my friends, that takes a, really takes a lot of pressure off me, so I appreciate that. Thanks, bud. Yeah, that, that's pretty much what happened, as you, as you probably could guess. Well, my challenge is that this week was sent to us by listener Gabriel GS, and it's for the card Festering Evil. Um, for those who don't know, which is everyone but Gabriel GS, basically... <laughs> <laughs> um, Festering Evil is an enchantment, three black, black. And at the beginning of your upkeep, Festering Evil deals one damage to each creature and each player. Or you can spend double black and sacrifice it and deal three damage to each creature and each player. And Gabriel wants to challenge the stats on it um, because it's only in 346 decks. And the direct comparison here is Pestilence, which is in over 10,000 decks. But it plays a bit differently. Um, instead of paying mana for damage, the damage comes in passive increments each upkeep, which might save you mana depending on the application. Uh, for example, it saves mana in Belby, so you can make six black on the turn after you cast it. It works well with Grim's Mold. It works uh, killing all the tokens he creates for free on your upkeep and pumping him up. Oh. <laughs> Same case with Karazov, Sanger, Pureblood. Um, it works marvelously with Rona, Tolarian Obliterator, kind of a better Dark Confidant. Um, it enables Rakdos, Lord of Riots. What? And it does a lot of things Pestilence does already anyway. The other interesting thing about it is the possibility of playing Black Black for three extra damage in a turn, which kind of works as a cheaper Wrath because it winds up being four damage. Uh, for four damage with Pestilence, you need to spend eight mana instead of seven. It isn't the kind of card that you're probably going to want to run in just your everyday deck, but like in those specific decks that do something when you deal damage to everyone kind of simultaneously, it's a really good card and is not seeing nearly enough plays. I think that's a really good call in those in those niche decks, Gabriel. That is so... Uh, man... <laughs> <laughs> I, I especially love the Grismold suggestion there because uh, yeah. Gris, Grismold's one of those commanders that people do not have enough respect for. Like, oh yeah, I'll give out one ones. I'm giving out one ones, and people are like, oh, you know, it seems whatever. And then like all of those one ones die, and then Grismold is punching somebody for like 18 damage. Like this is a great way to to facilitate that. That is what an interesting card. I'm glad it has new artwork. Uh, I'm glad that this card has received uh, a new printing that is a little bit less horrifying as well. Well, having just challenged all those stats, why don't we go back to challenging stats regarding how many cards of each type we should run in a particular deck? Uh, C plus on that segue there, Dana. I think that Matt's segue <laughs> into the challenge of stats was a little bit smoother. <laughs> should we start stealing segues out of challenge stats too, Matt? I, I, I no, we can. no, never mind. A plus, Dana. <laughs> no, it was great. It was great. Okay, don't, don't, this, we're fine. All right. Uh, yeah, you know, we talked about like different land counts and stuff, and that's 
that's a pretty thorny one there. And like, you know, we mentioned 36 tends to be a, a base, but then we talked about some commanders that want to go all the way down to 30 or commanders that want to go all the way up to above 40. Um, lands are a pretty easy one to measure. I feel like removal spells can be a little bit more eclectic though. Like we all certainly want to make sure that we're running a, a decent enough density of board wipes and, you know, pinpoint removal spells. Dana, I'll throw this question to you. Like, do you have a certain metric of those that you're trying to hit these days? I mean, not necessarily. I, I usually like am trying to run, you know, three or four creature removal spells and, and roughly that many that deal with other utility things. Mm. And if you're in a color combination like white and black with a bunch of options that deal with anything, then, you know, I, I try to find as many the spells that solve any problem as I can. But uh, so I, I mean, like, I'm usually in the 8 to 10 area, all told, between spells that are mostly designed to solve problems. Okay, okay. And Matt, does that track for you as well, do you think? Um, probably pretty close. I know I, at the bare minimum, I would say 5 or 6, but in some of my more control-heavy decks, if you count board wipes as some sort of removal, I'm upwards of 10, depending on the deck. Um, so it's, it's all over the place, but I set the absolute floor at 5 or 6, I would say. Sure. Yeah. So that I think sounds pretty reasonable to me. Like I'm not going to play like five board wipes in a deck. That feels like no. a bit of overkill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But pinpoint removal, like I definitely want to make sure I've got those because they can save your bacon. If someone else is trying to combo off or if they're about to hit you with one really big creature, I definitely like having those cheap instant speed removal spells. But there is an exception for me where I am definitely making sure to run fewer removal spells. And that's because y'all know I have that Karazakar the Eye Tyrant deck, which is my Rakdos Goad deck. I am forcing my opponent's creatures to attack each other. And man, in a Goad deck, I gotta say... I don't want to run a whole lot of removal spells because I would rather just point those creatures in different directions. Like, your creatures work for me. So the pinpoint removal and the board wipe removal in that deck has really gone down, down, down ever since I first built it. I have just been like, oh, I don't need a whole lot of board wipes. I actually kind of want the board to be huge. Would I rather cast a damnation to destroy all creatures or a spectacular showdown to goad them all and give them all double strike and watch the madness unfold? That's kind of been my energy with those decks. Well, and even just playing, I, I have a control deck and I'm not playing a bunch of the black board wipes or anything like that. But in my Council of Four deck, it's a very much control deck. I'm using my opponents to kind of do the dirty work for me. I play a lot of the goad. The, the impetus cards are one of my favorite cards because it gives me a bonus whenever one of my opponents attacks another one of my opponents. Mm. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So I want there to be big, beefy creatures that are going to do some scary things because a it puts everyone on the defensive everybody's trying to worry about blockers and taking care of this big crazy creature but also it means i don't have to worry about it attacking me anymore because it is permanently goaded yeah having things that allow you to play around the removal mechanic in whatever way shape or form are super valuable in the command zone just because it like frees up slots in your deck and i don't there's no more valuable resource than commander i don't think than slots in a deck and being able to free up a lot of them by having a, a commander that just does some of that work for you uh, is a super useful thing and a super powerful thing in this game for sure. Yeah, and I think that this can kind of cause some difficult experiences uh, when <laughs> in games. I think that it can kind of look a little bit mysterious to other players why, for example, I might not be helping to remove stuff that opponents are playing. They've got all of the big ridiculous creatures over there and I'm not helping to solve the problem. I'm not going out of my way to remove any of those things. And it's because if I'm playing a deck like that, or if I'm playing a deck that happens to include stuff like, I don't know, a mob rule, for instance, that's a situation where I, I want the board to be huge. And so I think that if you're playing one of those decks where you're planning to insurrection everybody later on, you can possibly get away with a little bit more of those efficient removal. Your opponents might be a little perplexed by you, like, why aren't you helping solve these big problems? But you've got a good reason. Those cards will take all of those creatures that you're letting live and potentially force them to do your bidding instead. So I think Goad's a strong example there. If you're playing some of those insurrection-y type of strategies, that can really actually be to your benefit to avoid the traditional removal stuff in favor of something that turns those things uh, uh, against your opponents instead. And that can be a really enjoyable time. Maybe not for your opponents, but definitely for you. Well, uh, another kind of specific corner case that you run into sometimes are commanders that don't care very much about ramp at all. 
Hmm. Um, the one that I think of here right away is I have a very old Edrix Pondmaster of Tress deck that I don't play very often, but it is a deck that just doesn't particularly need ramp. It, it's 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 my one deck that doesn't have a soul ring for one because almost everything in it is a is a spell that just costs a single pip. Hmm. Um, so there's very little use for colorless mana. But because of that super low curve, you know, it, it runs less lands than normal too, as we discussed earlier. But it, it it runs no ramp really, basically at all, other than a few things that cost zero, um, because it doesn't need to. I mean, like, when, when everything costs one mana, you can play three or four spells a turn very very easily. Ramp doesn't really do you a lot of good in that kind of deck unless it's hyper efficient. And Edric is a three mana creature that lets you draw a card whenever uh, one of your creatures deals damage to one of your opponents, or basically whenever any creature deals damage to an opponent, the person who controls their creature draws a card, but like you are going to take advantage of that more than anybody else. So Edric decks tend to run a lot of one drop creatures that have some form of evasion, whether it's flying or being unblockable. And when you have, you know, your commander out on turn three, there's a good chance you've already played three creatures and you're drawing three cards. Um, the ramp isn't going to do you any good. You're, you are playing creatures as fast as you can draw them using those kind of decks. Mm. And, and it's also one that kind of falls under that doesn't need that many lands like um, Garrison Starn because it's planning on winning so quickly too. <laughs> if, the, if the game is going to turn seven, that ship has probably already sailed. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so there's a lot of reasons that that like that Edric deck in particular runs less land and less ramp and frankly less draw spells too. This one is, hits a whole bunch of different quadrants here for for a deck that's built in a way that's probably not how you traditionally build a deck. I love that. I actually, I, I have two decks that I think run a total of four ramp spells in, in each deck. Uh, I have a Vohar Vodalian Desecrator deck. This is the Merfolk Looter in the Command Zone. There's a lot of extra words on it. I've, I've only ever used the ability to draw a card and discard a card from this commander. And that is my reanimator deck. So like having a lot of lands, having a lot of mana acceleration is just not necessary because what I'm planning to do is immediately pitch some enormous eight drop creature into the graveyard and then revive it for two or three or four mana with some type of animate dead or necromancy or zombify effect so like all i ever really need is four mana and i'm set so i've got like a soul ring and an arcane signet and maybe like a demir signet and a talisman in that deck and i'm that's it <laughs> that's all that that deck needs and then the other one i've got is barakos party leader which is a commander that makes treasures and th that one also i'm like yeah, I mean, the commander's four mana, so I'll probably play a couple of those two mana ramp spells that might make me able to play this commander on turn three instead of waiting until turn four. But I do not need a lot of ramp in that deck because the commander's already doing it for me. So I want to make sure I play enough lands to hit my land drops and get the commander out there. But in terms of the mana acceleration, eh, I've got that covered. So I've got a couple of decks that don't run a lot of ramp spells because... I just don't need them. Based on what those decks are doing, ramp spells would be super redundant to the strategies. Well, and if you want to talk about commanders that kind of break multiple rules at once, because of treasures especially, Prosper Tomebound is kind of the poster, I can't say poster child, poster demon, really, uh, for this type of effect where you have so many treasures going on, you're making so many that you don't really need a whole lot of ramp, but also with cards like Professional Facebreaker and other th cards like that, you're getting your card draw taken care of as well. You're getting all sorts of boxes checked that it's not going to look like your typical deck. And it really presents a lot of space for deck building expression because you don't have to worry about a lot of the, the veggies that Dana talks about. You know, you got kids, make sure you eat your veggies for a healthy deck. <laughs> Prosper just kind of ignores all of that convention and it just goes straight on. Okay, well, I have all these treasures and I have rewards for treasures. So what can I actually do to have fun with the deck? Right. Doesn't need extra ramp spells because everything is yep. a ramp spell. Yep. Well, I talked about how Edric has draw based in, so you don't really need to run very much draw in that, that deck. There's a bunch of commanders where that kind of is true of as well. Um, the big ones that pop into my mind are, are, are AC Tyrant of Gyre Straits and Tatiova, two commanders that draw you a card whenever you play land. Um, so, you know, there are probably ones that want to run more lands than normal to make sure you always have a land drop available and never miss them. And are probably running fetch lands so you can, you know, get multiple land drops off kind of a single land drop, basically. Um, but they also really don't need any card draw. Um, I'm not sure how happy you'd be to draw that harmonize when you've already <laughs> drawn 14 cards in the turn from various, like, landfall shenanigans. 
Um, it's just there in the commander. And then there's quite a few commanders, I think, that kind of fall into this. Um, in, in the card draw one, it's a little bit even easier to skip than some of the other ones. You know, we, we talked about how you need to have at least enough lands to play your commander in, in the decks that don't um, need a ton of lands. And, and the same is true, like, in, in decks that don't need ramp. Well, you still probably want to get to your commander as fast as possible. So you don't need ramp, but, like, Soul Ring is still pretty useful as an accelerant if you can use a colorless mana. Um, with draw spells, though, um, you don't need that thing to get to the point necessarily. Mm. If you can, you can draw isn't getting AC out necessarily any faster than it would be. It's not getting um, Tatiova out any faster, really. And once they're out, then you immediately can start just drawing those cards. So it's it's even easier to cheat, I think, in the in the, in the don't need draw spell category. Yeah, I have an AC Tyrant of Gary Straits deck, and this absolutely needs zero draw spells. All it needs to do is just ramp, get AC out, and then just keep ramping. Yeah. That's it's it's so kind of just almost like mind-numbingly simple <laughs> that just how easy it is. And a lot of people, yes, you, you harmonize is always good. You have your can trips, which are always good to find cards that you need. But even some of the higher upside cards like Gush would absolutely be fantastic, but you don't need it because you're already drawing so many cards that eventually it, it's very, very possible to run out of resources to draw because the effect is so powerful. And we had Tatiova kind of kick off this where Simic decks go burr type of meme, whatever you want to say. But yeah, it's absolutely possible with some of these commanders that we're talking about where you just draw too many cards. I would say Corvold is another example of this. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. The, whenever someone says you need to play at least N number of draw spells, I think that Corvold scoffs in your general direction, and also so does Chu Lane. Probably. <laughs> uh, and also so does Niv Mizzet, and also so does Jorah Weatherlight Captain. All, all of these commanders that say, whenever you do X simple thing, you draw a card, whether that's playing a historic spell, or whenever you get to deal the damages, whenever you play a tiny creature, whenever you sacrifice something, which is really easy to do in some of these commanders. Like, uh, yeah, uh, Matt, AC is one of the decks where I dare say that you'd be able to get away with not playing your favorite favorite card on this planet, Rishkar's Expertise, because you yeah. do not need it, and you draw more cards with a more efficient ramp spell instead of that, which is pretty wild to say. So so you say, I, I don't need it, but I want it. I still <laughs> yeah, want it. I understand. But, 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 but there's a recurring theme with all these commanders that we just kind of rattled off for everybody, is they all take some resource that you're working with in the game, whether it's the, the, the Simic commanders with AC and, and Taxi over the turn, lands into draw spells, or Corvold turning, you, whenever you sacrifice something, you're drawing cards. Or Joyra, who just cast a spell and draw a card. It, all of them are taking some basic, basic resource with some, okay, when you do that thing, you get to draw a card. And you want to do those things anyways in most typical decks. So just adding some sort of reward really makes it just so straightforward that you don't need to water down the deck because you're already drawing so many cards just for showing up. Yeah, we did an episode a while back where we looked at the average number of draw spells and stuff, and we saw that um, Arcades the Strategist was running zero draw spells in the average deck because Arcades the Strategist already draws you a card whenever you play a defender creature. So you can just chain a bunch of defender creatures together, and that's your draw right there. Like, you would get more draw off of playing an eerie interlude to blink all of your defenders rather than playing some basic harmonize situation there. And and, and that's just it, right? Like when we apply those heuristics, when we have those deck building principles that we've learned over time for a really good reason. We've learned that we want to have enough mana resources or we don't want to run out of cards in hand because then we get stuck top decking all game. We've learned those principles for a good reason, but applying them to certain commanders... It, it would make it very difficult, for example, if I were holding fast to those deck building templates or whatever you want to call them, it would make it very difficult for me to give effective advice to, say, an Arcades player if I was holding too tightly to that type of idea in my head. And I would want to be more flexible in understanding why their deck is constructed in a way that is different from my usual expectations. Yeah, that's a really good way to 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 look at that. Like you, being being as aware of all the different variables as possible here with this stuff is very difficult to do um but but the more aware you are the the more time it will save you the more problems it will save you and then when you kind of realize that for one deck then the next time you encounter one of these decks even if the the um things it needs or or doesn't need are different 
you've still seen it that one time. So you're, it's a little bit easier to recognize those patterns a second time. Yeah, precisely. And, and this is a, a thing that I know I run into when I'm doing the upping the average series on this channel, because I'll load up an average deck and I'll see that this commander is only playing 33 lands. And I'm like, I mean, that feels low to me. And most of the time, most of the time, it is too low. Most of the time, I think that we can get away with the general, like a, a general statement saying that folks are not running enough lands. I think usually that's true. But ever so often, Every so often, it's like a lands deck, or it's an Edric situation where it's just like, okay, you can get away with a little bit different on the number of ramp or removal or lands that you're playing, and it takes some practice to understand exactly why. But I, I do still think that it's fine to say that usually people could could stand to play a few more draw spells, and, and people could you know stand to play more lands than on average. I think that's usually still a safe thing to say, and it's especially a safe thing to say when we're telling Dana that he needs to run more basic lands, please. Why are you only running like four basic lands in your decks, my guy? Because I can't get away with running three. <laughs> wow, Matt, save me. <laughs> I know that's, that was brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if I can save it at this point. So why don't we just do this? Let's ask our listeners, why don't you let us know in the comments what type of decks you have or what commanders that typically don't follow some of those, you should play X number of these cards and follow any of those heuristics like we talked about. So let us know in the comments while we try to wrap up and see how we can even end this show. So Joey, um, <laughs> please, I hope you have a plan because I don't anymore. Oh, so I'm allowed to have this segue out of the show? I well, see yeah. how it is, Matt. Well, we, we, we were in Minnesota for MagicCon Minneapolis, and that Minnesota nice is just taking over. So I, I'm, I'm wanting you to, to, to do your job. I would, oh, I would Matt, love... why don't you tell us where people can find you? Dang it. No, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dana, you can find me on Twitter at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And we stream Wednesday evenings, twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast, where we have guests on whenever we stream. And it's always a super fun time. So make sure you tune in for that as well. And Dana, where can people find you? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. I'm running articles for EDH Rec. And you can come find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Retcast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz, and you can find the cast at EDH Retcast on all the online places as well. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRetcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs> <laughs>